Good morning. Thank you for coming, even after the party. Um, okay, I just want to point out that yesterday was Aaron Swartz Day, and if you don't know who he is, you should look him up. Um, I think a lot of what happened to him is a lot of what's wrong. Uh, and so look him up. Um, I think he is a good example of, of all of the things that we should fix. Okay, so my talk is called Trust Elections on Twitter, or alternatively, how to ignore someone so incredibly loudly it becomes conspicuous. So it's going to be a talk about that kind of starts with me tweeting into the void. And you're going to see throughout the talk that um, I'm not particularly famous or popular on Twitter. <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, Patricia Oss. I'm a programmer. I uh, work mostly in C++. I've been working uh, as a programmer for 12 years. I currently work for Vivaldi Technologies. We make the Vivaldi browser. And I brought some swag, it's up there, so grab some. Uh, I previously worked at Cisco, for, and uh, at Knowit I was a consultant for two years, and then before that I worked on the Opera browser, which was also a very excellent browser. I have a master's in computer science from this university. And uh, yeah, so what does that even have to do with elections? And which election are we talking about? Uh, the election is a Norwegian parliamentary election that happened this fall. So it's only a few months ago. It was on the 11th of September. Um, but what am I in that context? Well, not really important. I was just a person kind of tweeting. I have some um, personal interest in elections. I wrote my thesis uh, on election systems, but I haven't really done anything about elections. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. But before we start, I want to talk a little bit about how I felt in the middle of this, because what I'm going to describe is uh, a process. And so I'm going to start at the beginning, but before I start at the beginning, I'm going to start in the middle. So this is me, uh, seven weeks in, and I have basically won. And this is my tweet. In English, it says, sorry, I'm a bit down now. I hope someone manages to be heard. I've been made completely invisible. I'm so tired of their domination techniques. And it's funny, I've won here. <laughs> this is four days after I had won. And this is how I felt. And you can also see that I wasn't, you know, a particularly popular tweet. <laughs> um, but it has six replies, and I think that is the most important thing throughout my entire thing, was how important random strangers on the internet were to my well-being. Because I said this into the void, and s people came back and said, I think what you're doing is really important. And that's always what got me over the hard parts, was just a random stranger saying something kind. And then, okay, and then I picked myself off the floor and then I went on trucking. So I wanna talk a little bit about these things because they come through the entire story. And two of the words I made up, <laughs> but uh, because I feel like the, they're getting words, but they're very gendered, the words that are, are common. So the first one is a classical domination technique. Uh, there, uh, in Norwegian, it has a word called hashke technique. It's called in Norwegian. It means making someone feel invisible. Um, it's a very common thing, and most people have experience with it in their daily lives. Uh, you are in some kind of group uh, where you are less powerful, less cool, less popular, less something. And when you speak, nobody actually acknowledges that you spoke. Most people have experienced this at some point in their lives. Uh, and when you are invisible, it enables the, the second one, which I call appropriation. In appropriation, you have spoken in a group, you're not very important. Uh, but someone who is important, who is powerful, hears what you said. 
They don't acknowledge that you said it, but they hear what you say. Then they wait a little bit and then they say it. <laughs> and when they say it, it's totally different than when you said it. And when they say it, everybody goes, ah, great idea. That's really good that you brought that up, that, you know. And it, I call it appropriation because they're appropriating your idea. They're taking your idea making and saying that it, and presenting it as their own. Now, this is only possible if you are invisible. Because if you are not invisible, other people say like, why did you do that? I mean, I just heard Patricia say that. That's kind of weird that you say that. <laughs> what? She said it first. So it's only possible to do with someone who is invisible. But then you have a technique called ghostwriting, which is a, the opposite or sort of related here. If you are invisible and you know you are invisible, but you have something that you feel is important, then you can use this technique to give your idea to someone who is more powerful. Now, you can do this in two ways. Either they know or they don't know. <laughs> I, I've done both ways. Uh, you, generally, you generally will do it uh, with their knowledge if it's someone that you like and that you trust, but they're more powerful than you. Then you might go and you say like, I have this idea, can you please just present it because nobody listens to me. And then, Oftentimes, those kinds of people, because you trust them, there's a reason why you trust them, um, when they, they'll present the idea, they'll get it accepted, they'll do a lot of things for you, but at a certain point, generally in the future, they'll go like, yeah, and this idea was Patricia's idea. So they'll point back to you. But it doesn't, it's not a big part of ghostwriting, you don't have to get the point back. The whole point of ghostwriting is you've got an important thing you need to get done. The other one is, is uh, I've used many times, is that you know somebody is an appropriator. You know that they're that kind of person. So then you just kind of use that, use it against them by telling them something at the coffee machine. <laughs> Knowing that, you know, they'll take care of it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go through what happened, but I'd like you to keep those things in mind. So we'll start at the beginning. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that my tweets are in Norwegian. And I usually don't tweet in Norwegian. Um, and the reason why I, uh, I tweeted in Norwegian is that I wanted them, the government, uh, to feel like I was actually talking with them instead of about them. It was my attempt at being nice. <laughs> uh, it didn't work, but you know. So my tweets are in Norwegian, but I'll try to translate them. Uh, so basically, in this case, I started off uh, tweeting at uh, what is called Kommunal uh, uh, Moderniseringsdepartementet. What is it called? Uh, municipal and Modernization. Yeah, well, ish. Yeah, okay, let's go for that. They actually called like municipal something. Anyway, so uh, I, they used to be in charge of the election. And I thought they still were. And so I tweeted tw uh, to them. And the reason why was because I've been watching uh, this uh, hack, um, hacking village that was at DEF CON. Uh, now, just paying attention to it on Twitter. It wasn't like I was at DEF CON, but I was just watching the tweets that were coming out of this hacking village where they were hacking on voting machines. And they were very successful in that endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> so it got me thinking. I wonder what it's, uh, what, because I knew that we were using computers to count votes in Norway. And so I was wondering, how is the security around the machines that do vote counting in Norway, ballot counting? So that's what I asked. I said, what's the state of the machines that count our votes? Are, these third, are there third party audits of them? And <clears throat> nothing happened. Okay, we should probably go back and say, I have two likes and two retweets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was myself answering and, and, uh, and probably one of those retweets is also me. Um, so I, I'm, not very, I, I'm not very popular on Twitter. So I was very easy to ignore and, uh, and ignored I was. Nothing happened. I, I kept like retweeting and myself and just like asking every few days, like what's going on? Can you answer me? Uh, but nothing happens and 12 days go by. 
And then this happens. And the reason why this happened is that I had been trying to tag all sorts of newspapers, but newspapers weren't really paying attention to me. I tried to um, ask if I knew anybody who was a journalist who could maybe write about it, because if maybe if it was in the paper, then somebody would answer me. Uh, but then somebody said, you know what, write something to the paper yourself. And so I did. I wrote uh, an opinion piece, uh, and it was published in Vega, and it was a full page thing. Um, and the headline is really long because I didn't actually make a headline, so they just picked a sentence <laughs> <laughs> and put it up there. And it goes, uh, the easiest way to manipulate an election is to go after the, the computers, uh, the software, and the developers that make them. And so I ask on Twitter with a picture, because this was in a paper newspaper, it wasn't online. Um, full page opinion piece in Vega today, maybe somebody will answer me now. I asked a bunch of questions. And this is, most of my opinion piece was basically just describing, I was talking to normal people, right? So I was describing how this would work. And, but this is the only part that actually has any questions. Now I'm not going to go through all of it. It's not really interesting. It's pr mostly things that you would find obvious to ask about, like what kind of hardware, what kind of operating system, do we have any controls of the count, all sorts of things like that. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I didn't ask, which, I, which is interesting in retrospect, I didn't ask if these computers were connected to the internet. I did. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me at all. Oh, sorry. Yes. I thought so. Okay. So after I published this um, uh, in the paper, I had, uh, and I also published a, like a link of it on Facebook, and uh, a former colleague of mine called Vetla, who used to work at Opera. Um, he also worked on the EVOLG project, which is a project for doing internet voting. And so he was commenting on my post on Facebook, uh, basically saying that, you know, they're probably not going to answer you. <laughs> and uh, you should probably do this uh, through proper channels. And I was uh, naive and I said that I'm going to give them some time and I'll be really disappointed if they're that opaque, non-transparent. But we'll get back to Vetla, because Vetla, he just went off on his own after this. Anyway, nothing happened. Uh, so I'd published it in the paper, I'd been tweeting on Twitter, but nobody was really caring. Um, but I kept on tweeting. I don't know why, but I kind of felt like they should answer. I felt like just the fact that they weren't answering was a problem that this was something that should be open. And then suddenly, I got an answer. And it was from the director of the uh, election directorate. And he didn't really answer my questions. <laughs> he talked a lot about stuff that wasn't even, I wasn't even talking about. He was talking about a little bit about the central server, uh, which I didn't ask anything about. I was asking about the, the computers that were actually doing the ballot counting. I'm not going to go through it all uh, because it wasn't really interesting. He did say some things. Uh, he said that there had been a penetration testing, L but I had also been reading later after this, uh, NSM, who's the National Security Authority of Norway, uh, went out and talked about this penetration testing, which was against the central server again. So it was c clear that nobody has actually looked at the counting machines. And, and of course, he talks about trust, of course. Uh, you sh trust me, I know what I'm doing, which, <laughs> which to me usually means I do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got kind of pissed off. So I tweeted in English suddenly. Because what, what kind of annoyed me is the fact that there are many ways to, to, uh, to hack an election. There are hundreds of ways to hack an election. Uh, and if you are not conscious of it, it's very easy to fall in 
to problems. So I, I did, I did uh, three just examples of, of interesting ways that I thought would be fun. Um, and the first one was a ballot counting, a ballot counting machine botnet. I thought that would be the best. Um, the idea would then be that I would uh, infect all of the ballot counting machines. I would control them from a central server or more, and the, and then I could measure um, in real time how's it going different places. So I would know, like, I ha don't have to do anything here because that's going okay. But over here, I'm going to go and put Venstre a little bit up, and uh, you know, and and SV a little bit down. <laughs> And because th that is the thing about Norwegian elections for the last 15 years, they're so, so close. And generally what flips an election from being a red to a blue government is generally the really small parties. The parties that have that have 0, 0.0 something percent that could flip them over or under uh, what we call spadegrensa. And that makes a huge difference in the number of mandates. Um, and the second one was spear phishing, uh, because I was thinking I would uh, get to one of the developers. Because the easiest way to manipulate the source code was to get one of the developers to actually check in what I wanted them to check in. And so I wanted to find some kind of compromising information about them and then extort them to make them do my bidding. Uh, and the third one was basically I, I wanted to uh, get into their network in, in, in the... Um, in the directorate, and then I would have access to all the source code and everything. And the easiest way to get somebody to open a document in any kind of organization is to send it to HR. Because <laughs> that's their job. <laughs> they open attachments. That's what they do, and so I thought, you know, that would be a good way, or maybe just because they're election nerds, I could probably get away with like an article on elections, and they would probably open that too. But I was, I was being childish. I was being annoyed at this point because I felt ignored. I'd been going at this for a long time. And I was basically being treated very condescendingly. And so I got annoyed. Which is kind of weird because I know better, right? Um, I've been doing, I've been working on browsers a long time. I've worked on embedded software for Cisco. I've I've worked professionally with things that have big security concerns. And so I really actually know the best way to report things, right? I even made a pres I even made a talk about it. This is a slide from one of my talks, um, which is called Make It Fixable, where I talk about different ways of handling getting vulnerability reports. And so this is this is for companies that says that you have to treat your, your security researchers, your, the people who are reporting vulnerabilities to you, you have to treat them with respect. You have to be transparent about what happens when you get a report and how you're treating it, how you're dealing with it. There, this, there is a culture around this, and especially if you're not getting any money for it, if, then there is uh, the, uh, the expectation that it's going to be a transparent process where the person will get some kind of recognition. And there's like time constraints, and this is a whole thing. And here I am just tweeting things on the internet. It's not really good form. All I can say to my defense is I didn't know anything. I couldn't report anything because I didn't know anything. That was the problem. I was asking questions, but I didn't have any answers. It wasn't like I could actually say, you know what, you guys have a vulnerability here. Because at this point in time, I had no idea what was going on. <sighs> but nothing happens, <laughs> as usual. And I keep tweeting to myself, as usual. And then something happens. On August 24th, two people come to me and tell me that they have a document. And the reason why they got the document, and it's funny because I, I didn't know that they had tried, but two people independently had read my, or my, my VEG piece and had decided to actually do what I didn't and go through formal channels. And they got this document. Um, and so I started reading it. 
And this was a Friday, and I was at work, and uh, I work on the Chromium C++ code, which means I do a lot of compiling. <laughs> So I was doing a lot of compiling. So you know like the, the XKCD uh, fighting with the sword thing? Maybe. Um, yeah, well, I was reading this instead. So while I was compiling, I was reading, and I was tweeting. And I made a really long thread. I think it's like, or for me, really long. It's like 35 tweets or something. Uh, but what I found out reading this document was basically that these were Windows machines. Yes. <laughs> and they were Windows machines on the internet. And also that it was basically, the whole manual was about how they had made it easy for people in the commune to, to set this up themselves. <laughs> so it, it, it had, had whole sections that talked about how you don't have to buy new computers to do this. You can take computers you already have. And these are desktop machines or even laptop machines. And you can just take like stuff you already have. Um, what you do is you download some software from a website and you install it on the machine and you have a bunch of these um, scanning machines. Then the, there you can, also, you can also use scanners you have already. You hook them up to a laptop or a personal computer. And, and then there's one machine that has to be the, the Microsoft SQL server. The idea is that you kind of scan the picture of a ballot and then you send it to this central server. Uh, or central, okay, central in your room, right? because you set this up in your own room. And, uh, and there it stores pictures in a SQL relational database, which is weird, but you know, <laughs> they do. And he spent like, and the, I, I'm saying he, but I am so sure the person who wrote this document was a man, so I'm just gonna go for the go for man here. Um, and he spent a whole half a page talking about why storing images in a relational database is not stupid. And that's fine. Okay, whatever rocks your boat, that's okay. I'm good with that. It was highly redacted, but there was a lot of stuff in there. And it was basically, it was pretty, pretty clear that this wasn't really meant for being secure, but it was meant for being easy to set up and cheap for the, the, the different kinds of community. Now, one thing that was, became clear is that you could hire somebody to do this for you. There were three companies and I'll get back to that, that were licensed to do the setup for, for you in the commune. Um, but you didn't have to. And nobody would check the setup. So I got more and more shocked <laughs> as I read this thing. And so this was on a Friday. So on the Saturday, because this is a document, it's called Boken om Eva Scanning, the PDF is online. I'll, I'll tweet a link later so you can read it yourself. It's not very long. It's like 52 pages. Um, so this is this is the the research thread. Now I'd like you to like. Okay, I took these pictures of the tweets like only like a few weeks ago, long after this had been a big deal. And I'd like to point out that they're not like really viral. <laughs> I mean, this is like one of the like most important tweets. I have like maybe two important tweets. This is like the second one and it's got 29 likes. Okay, I don't usually like my own tweets, so I'm assuming that none of the, the likes are mine. But but I, I do retweet my own tweets because I want like I kind of want to say, you know what, I said this thing, it's important. So one of the retweets is definitely mine. Um and nothing really happened. <laughs> so the thing is, now, now I'm sitting there going like, come on, we have Windows machines counting our ballots. We, they're connected to the internet. Nobody's checking them. What's going on? Why doesn't anybody care? I mean, seriously, I've been tweeting to myself now for a month and nobody cares. It's like, I know I'm not cool. I know I, I don't have like hundreds of thousands of followers, but come on, this is important. So I get pissed off again. And then I decide, OK, fine. If you guys don't want to read anything, then I'm going to boil it down for you. And then I wrote in the space of 20 minutes, like 10 tweets. And then I basically did a bullet point list of things I'd found out in the really long, more like babbly thread that I did the day before. 
starting with this tweet. Now, this is my coolest tweet. It says, the machines that count the votes under the election are random Windows machines connected to the internet that all run the same program. It was tweeted on a Saturday night. I was very frustrated at the time, but this is, this went viral, viral in my scale, right? So this is like a hundreds of, uh, of uh, likes and, and retweets. Now you have to understand that viral in my scale means I usually have one, maybe. <laughs> so this is big. And it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> because I was kind of used to talking to myself, so I felt, you know, that I could get pissed off by myself on the internet too, and then suddenly now all sorts of people are reading what I wrote, and th that kind of freaked me out because I didn't really think about it at the time. And, but it happened in the space of only a few hours. So I, I kind of pushed the th thread out. I was angry, and then I had to do some stuff around the house, and then suddenly I could hear my phone going beep, 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 beep. And this was being retweeted. People were answering, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm a woman that said something on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared. I was so scared. This is going to go and escalate really quickly. It did. I ended up on Reddit. But... <laughs> But we'll get back to that. But it's, it, it was very scary. And so I basically, I said, okay, fine. I have to be on top of everything. So I was sitting and I was watching and anything that anybody wrote, I replied to everyone. I read everything that anybody mentioned me in. I was on it. I was sitting doing this all evening and then until three o'clock in the morning, I was still answering people on Twitter because I was so scared because the thing is, I still didn't know a lot. I was basing all of this on one document. I was really afraid that I was wrong, that there was somebody would come in and say, yeah, but you know, you missed all of this obvious stuff and you're an idiot. I was, I was really afraid. But that night I go on LinkedIn. Well, this is, these are the threads, uh, this, uh, this is like the cleaned up version, and this is like the messy version where I have pictures of the document. But that night I go on LinkedIn. Now, uh, the two very important things here. First of all, we'll start at the top. Um, I have 124 profile visits in the last 90 days. That is an increase of 538%. Now, that sounds like a lot, but you have to see that the number they got to wasn't that high. So I wasn't cool on LinkedIn either, <laughs> which is amazing. I, I wasn't cool on Twitter. I was not cool on LinkedIn. The second part is, look who's on a Saturday evening who comes looking at my LinkedIn profile. It's the director of the National Security Authority in Norway. On Saturday night, he's in on my LinkedIn going, who is this woman? <laughs> Where is this shit coming from? And I was, come on, I was scared being a woman. I was saying stuff on the internet, and now the director of the National Security Authority was looking me up on LinkedIn. I wasn't feeling cool at this point. And suddenly everybody cared. There was a lot of people who were liking and retweeting me who were either, they were generally in two groups. Either they were in, in technology in Norway or they were in culture. And, and the, the thing that was interesting was that the people in culture, they knew lots of people in the newspapers. <laughs> they knew journalists. They had, like, they had that network, the media network. Uh, and the fact that all these people in technology were saying that this is right they also, I think, felt that it validated the content, right? That it said that this stuff that I might not understand is important. And the combination of those two things made suddenly I went from nobody cares what I'm saying to suddenly everybody cares what I'm saying. And suddenly I get a DM um, from uh, Turgai Waterhouse who is the leader of uh, Ecotel Norge, which is an uh, organization around IT in Norway. And I had never spoken to him in my life. I had seen him at a conference, like seen him from afar. Um, 
but he calls me. No, he sends me a DM on Saturday night asking me if he could call me on Sunday. And I said, sure, because I'm thinking, you know what? I could just give all of this to him and he can just run with it and I can go and hide under my covers and just go like and wait until it all blows over. And that's, that was my plan on Sunday. So all sorts of people call me and he calls me, uh, but I'm thinking I'm just going to let this blow over because now it's known, it's out there, right? So it's going to fix itself. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so so Sunday night, I had told, I had talked to Turga. Turga had read the document, and he was also saying that this was crazy. And and uh, he was going to go on TV with the director. And I was like, okay, everything's fine. And I'm standing around in my pajamas in my house. And then suddenly, and that call calls me on the phone and goes like, we're going to go on TV in 30 minutes. Can you be here in 30 minutes? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I have no need to be on TV. That's exactly what I, call, I told him. I have no need to be on TV. And so I didn't go. They went on TV without me on Sunday night. And I wrote it to uh, a friend of mine who used to be a journalist, and I told her what I'd done, and I told her that I didn't want to go on TV. And she said, come on, Patricia, you've been tweeting about this stuff now for over a month. Nobody, nobody is answering you. Everybody is ignoring you. If you're ever going to get any answers to any of your questions, then you have to step up now. Because now is the only time you're going to get any answers. So she said, next time they call you, you say yes. And you say yes to everybody. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you got it. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say yes to everybody. I did. I said yes to everybody. I'm a huge nerd too, so this is really dangerous territory because the thing is, as a nerd, if somebody asks a good question, I want to answer. I'm like, oh, that is a really good question. I'm going to tell you exactly how that works. I was talking with journalists the entire Monday. I, I did nothing but talk to journalists. And uh, like early in the morning, the, the first person from TV called. It was from Doksnit Atten. And he goes like, uh, can you be on TV today? And I'm like, yes. I have no idea what I'm doing, but yes, I'm going to do that. And and then later on, like two hours later, they call from Doxerin, and they go like, can you be on TV today? And I'm like, seriously, <laughs> I'm already going to be on TV. So he's like, y you don't want to have me on TV twice in a day. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I'm going to call Doxerin Dalton. We're going to work it out. And two hours later, and they call again from a different uh, person calls me and goes, "Do you, can you be on TV tonight on the, 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 the election report? thing. And I'm like, seriously, you guys have to talk. I mean, three people from the same news organization asking me to come on TV on the same day. I'm like, you guys figure out who gets me and I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and they call me and they go like, we all want to go. You're going to go on everything. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. People are going to be so tired of watching my face on TV. And they were like, no, but you have to understand that these like programs, like it's not the same people who watch these programs. These are hardly overlapping groups. <laughs> so this is not a problem. So I was, I was on TV three times on that Monday. I was in all sorts of newspapers. And this one, this is one uh, that I'm particularly proud of uh, because it basically showed that my, I was going for being professional. I was thinking, you know, I could get through this as like a classy professional woman in tech. It did not go well. I ended up saying this, I'm going to say it in Norwegian, and then I'm going to try to translate it to English. Basically, de kan ikke sitte på kammerset og mekke valgsystem uten at noen ser dem i kortene. Which I think might be mixing up about at least two metaphors. And it basically means that they can't sit, sit in a room without anyone and, and making an election system without anyone looking them in the cards. <laughs> the thing is, I read it and I said, I, I, probably, I probably said that. I probably, it sounds like me. 
and that's the thing. I couldn't even back out and say I didn't say that. It's like, the thing is, most of the journalists, they were paraphrasing me. So I was going good up until this point. But for some reason, this guy from Dog and Snatting Slave actually took proper notes. <laughs> And I was like, and I was sitting there going like, oh my God, what have I done? The whole professional thing kind of went out the window. Anyway, so it was all over the newspapers. And this was on the Monday. And I thought, you know what? And I even wrote it on Twitter. Now that it's all out there, this is going to be fixed. You know, they're going to fix it. I'm sure they're going to fix it. But that day on the Monday, I had two debates with the director of the, of the uh, election directorate. Uh, one on the Doxnit Atten and one in the election report in the evening. And the thing is, I, and this is Turgad, he had talked to me the day before and he had basically told me that you got to boil it down. You got to boil it down to one or two points because that's all you're going to get through the media. So just figure out what you want to say, boil it down to two things. What are those two things? And I'm like, and I thought about it, I thought about it, I talked to myself on the Sunday. I came to the point where, okay, there are two things. One, there, have, there has to be a way to check if the ballots were counted correctly. There has to be something to compare it to. There has to be some kind of control of the actual count when it happens. So they have to have something to compare it to. That was the one. And the second one is, if they find any discrepancy, there has to be a way that that is propagated. The information about that is propagated. So that, because if you have that, that Haida is getting 0.1 more votes in Bergen, there's a high likelihood that that is also happening other places in the country because it's the same software that's running everywhere. So I was trying to dig into this because I was trying to figure out if this was a risk. Because what people had told me is that certain places in Norway you would have a manual count and then you would have a, a computer machine count. And so I was like, okay, but if you have a manual count and a machine count, you're good. You have two numbers, right? You have two numbers that you can compare to each other. You have a possibility of discovery. But what I was afraid of was what if they didn't, uh, places didn't have a manual count? Because what I'd read in all sorts of reports is that you didn't have to have a manual count. There was nothing that said you had to. And so I was wondering how common was it not to? Um, so I asked, is the count and the recount done by the same system? And he says, we can't 100% exclude that possibility. <laughs> See, you laugh. But I'm, I'm like, I, I, I was sitting there going like, that's probably very unlikely then. <laughs> but I feel like I still want to know. That's, I have to say, the driving force behind me the entire time was curiosity. I was not very, like, very savvy in political speak because I'm not like that. I'm used to working with pro like programmers and nerds, and they're generally very straightforward. You can talk to them. They don't have all sorts of lying going on. And so, and the second thing is because then he started describing, oh, you can do a count there and you can do a count there and blah, blah, blah. And it's like he was talking about all of these ways that it, or places that you would do counting. And I was, uh, so I asked him, the counts that you're describing as being in different places, can they really all be in the same place? And he said, theoretically, your assessment is correct. I don't know. We'll get back to this slide. Okay. So of course, the what happened had to uh, what well what had to happen happened, and um, I was on Reddit and Hacker News. Suddenly, I did what I think most women would do the first time this happens to them. Uh, I started reading <laughs> on Reddit. I decided I didn't have to go there. <laughs> and I was like, you guys do whatever you want. I'm backing out of this. I don't even want to read it. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't need this in my life. I'm stressed out enough as it is. But I wrote it on Twitter. And 
I'm, I don't have it here, but I wrote a blog post about it. But it was a, one tweet that really, uh, really got to me, or it got to me in a good way. Because I wrote this and I said that this was, this was every programmer's nightmare, every female programmer's nightmare to be on the Reddit and Hacker News. And, well, and 4chan, but I didn't end up there. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, as far as I know. <laughs> um, and then, then one of my followers, he just said, we got this. And then they went. Like There was like three or four of my followers that were on Reddit, on Hacker News, and they were shutting people down. <laughs> Whenever anybody went off into the girl programmer thing, they went like, she has blah, 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 and they just kind of, they shut it down. So they were there, I was not there. They were taking care of it, I wasn't even reading it. And I have to say, it still gives me the chills. <laughs> because the thing is, I was so scared. And these were people I didn't even know. These are people on Twitter that I didn't know who did this for me. But I was exhausted. I was scared. I was really intimidated because this was like the government. It was a whole election directorate that was basically coming down on me. And I was not feeling great, but I was still saying yes to everybody. But nothing happened. Again, I had started... Um, on the Saturday with my, my, my thread, and by Friday, nothing was happening. And then they called me, asked me if I could be on TV again on the Friday, and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I had no idea how to do it because I was home with my three-year-old son because the, the, the kindergarten was closed, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm, I'll be there. I had to call my husband, he had to take my son and everything, but while we were doing this, and while I was walking with my son in, the stroller, on my way to the TV interview, I got this tweet on my phone, which means I didn't get like the top part. This is like the fancy view of it. I only got the middle part, which I didn't really understand because I was kind of walking. And it says, well, 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 this year's civil activism prize and congratulations go to Pati Gallardo. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I haven't done anything. <laughs> I haven't done anything. It's like, that's the whole point. Nothing's happening when I talk. And, and so then I go to the link and suddenly it says, all counts have to be counted manually. I got, I got like goosebumps on my, on my calves. I, <laughs> I was like, my whole body was like, oh my God, what happened? I went from being somebody that nobody cares about to suddenly this happens. And suddenly we're in the media again, big time. I was being interviewed on TV, in newspapers, everywhere again. <sighs> but I wasn't being really um, portrayed in a good way by the government. <sighs> Basically, uh, and I'll translate, um, um, the municipal government or the interior Ministry of Interior uh, says that there is no indication that someone is trying to influence the uh, election, but the increasing activity and attention around the technical solutions have increased, and this is in itself a risk. <laughs> or, in my mind, that went to Patricia is a threat to national security. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but thankfully, over the weekend, this was on the Friday, over the weekend, um, PSD changed their tone. But the problem is this was what went out in all the newspapers. And PSD changed their tone and, and said that the change in the election was, was closing a vulnerability, thankfully. And they thought it was over but I was still tweeting because I still had questions. But nobody's listening to me because it's over. The media is happy. I had a happy ending, so it was over. But the thing is foreign companies are setting up our ballot counting because what I found is that two of the three companies that are allowed to set up the ballot counting are not Norwegian companies. 
Only one of the three is Norwegian company. So then I got pissed off and I go like, okay, so what, if I wanted to change the Norwegian election, I would just bid on this. And then I could actually manipulate the election and get paid. And how would we discover and broadcast the manipulation? Because they wouldn't answer that question. I kept on asking, okay, so what happens if the manual and the machine count don't match? But they have no answer. And I'm exhausted and depressed. And that's when I tweet this. Because even though I won, I hadn't won. Nobody was answering me. But I'd sent some questions by email just before the regulation. And I hadn't gotten an answer. And remember what he said about the theoretical possibilities? It turns out, not only most of the, the um, votes that were cast before the election, they were mostly counted by machine, the same machine, both times. And that came out in the media. But what hadn't come out is that in addition to those, and those were several hundred thousand votes, 1.2 million Norwegians lived in Kommune and could vote, that were eligible to vote, lived in Kommune where you would have only manual counts uh, only, uh, only machine counts, both, so never any manual counts, and where all of the machine counts were done by the same machine in the same place. Which adds up to somewhere between 1.5 million to 2 million votes in the Norwegian election was never ever had any checks of the counts. And what happens if they're not the same? you can count them again by machine. Same machine. <laughs> so, so, so if you have a manual count and you have a machine count and they don't match, then you count again with the machine. And then I if that agrees with itself, then you, know, you take the machine count and you move on. So I got pissed off on the Twitter again. <laughs> we'll just skip that. Because the thing is, I was invisible. The media appropriated a lot of the stuff that I did. The lots of articles were written on my research but didn't mention my name, but that's all right. I did a lot of ghostwriting too, because I wanted people to lift it up because it wasn't working doing it by myself. But they were demanding trust, but they were being anything but trustworthy. So who's auditing the election? I was starting to think that it was nobody. Then the leader of the uh, Riksvalg Komitee, Riksvalg Styre, who is supposed to be the one that is in charge of, of receiving and handling all sorts of complaints about the election. And she says it doesn't act like an election oversight commission. If you are afraid, then uh, you can complain <laughs> to your local election authority. And any kind of national scale manipulation um, goes and should be handled by the directorate slash ministry slash parliament, which means nobody. <laughs> there is no one in charge of auditing the election. I have not been able to find a single entity in the government that is in charge of auditing the results of the election. And I'm almost done. So elections are paranoid by design. We built them up over thousands of years. Uh, they, were m they were built with the expectations that people would cheat. And it is paranoid and there is no trust. And that is so the rest of us can trust it. Because these people are not trustworthy. And another thing that was pretty clear, it was very difficult to tell who was friend or foe. Because for some people, I was the foe. I was the bad one. And they were acting like the bad one, and it's very unclear who was the good guy. But another really important lesson was that if you want to break out of the void, it's very difficult to do on your own if you are invisible. You need other people to lift your voice up. And they did, 
And so what I want to say is that I only had 300 likes and 300 re retweets on my thread. And I can tell you at least like 50, maybe 100 of those are porn bots. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you is that just doing that means something. It, it actually has an effect. I wouldn't have been able to do this if people didn't do that. So you might think, oh, but I'm just liking or retweeting something on Twitter. I'm not important. And that's what, but, but the thing is, they were the reason anything happened at all. So if I'm going to go out on like a good note here is that if we work together, we can make changes. If we actually support each other and lift each other's voices up, there is a possibility of making change. And you have to try to be bold. I, it's really scary to stand on your own and speak up against authority. But if we also support each other when things are bad, then people are brave enough and strong enough to do it. And that's it. And like I said earlier, I have some stuff up there. That's Vivaldi stuff, so you can. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes, uh, there are some questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, fantastic talk, but there's one thing I was at the same time hallucinating. <laughs> Why? Because I was member of the Dutch committee. We do not trust voting computers. By vertrouwen stem computers niet. We destroyed the carefully planned all computer election in a situation where 98% of the Dutch elections was uh, computer voted. This controversy, which is now more than 10 years old, went to Germany, where the Constitutional Court, having listened to the Chaos Computer Club as expert witness, legally stated that non-paper and pencil elections are uh, null and void. So all attempts to computerize elections in Germany was stopped. There is big controversy in Belgium there with quite some traction. There's a controversy in France. Uh, all this is years and is 10 years old. Now, I, I suspect that you expressed your own purpose didn't talk about this kind of prior but art. But the thing situation. is, the thing is, the problem, the problem, oh yeah, there's lots of prior art. But the problem with these kinds of elections here is that they seem safe because there is pa paper ballots, there is the so called paper trail, which is yeah. considered to be a very safe type of election. Uh, but the problem is, if nobody but computers is counting the paper ballots and nobody is checking it, then you're basically back to square one, but you're tricking everybody. Not sure where to start. You probably don't know me. I'm Peter Reynoldsen, one of the people behind Mimes Drum, the website. Ah, yes. Doing, um, the uh, request for information um, about the election system. It's organized and created by Norwegian Unique User Group. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very proud when my system, well, me and God's system, uh, was used to actually uh, get the information about the voting system out to the public. And I was uh, very, very happy to, uh, to, to see that our efforts had not been completely in vain. Of course, there had been many, many uh, smaller and larger uh, articles and, and, and events about different topics being exposed on Mimes Drum. Um, but um, I guess I know too much about freedom of information requests and the government, working in the government myself. Um, and uh, it is scary to realize that uh, it's pretty normal to be ignored. It's uh, the uh, easiest way to handle any kind of strange and annoying request. And uh, using Twitter is not a good way to actually <laughs> have any effect on the government. <laughs> Just get used to it. It's a useless channel into the government. Uh, and freedom of information request is a much better way because it's legally required to answer them. 
uh, they, they, it's actually illegal to ignore them. Yes, I agree. And you're right. But also the fact that this is election system means that they should be transparent. And that was my point. I shouldn't have to go through all sorts of hoops to get this information. This information should have been available. This should have been easy for them. They should have given me a link to a page describing all sorts of auditing documents. This should have been public. And I did it in this way consciously because I felt that this should be something. And come on, they were answering people on Twitter and they were reading all all of my tweets. I talked to them on the phone. I, a, a guy who was like way down in a thread uh, and uh, talking to me on Twitter got called up by phone asking what is he talking to me about. I talked to them on the phone and they and I said come on why are you asking me to send it in writing you're reading everything I write on Twitter and they were like okay yeah we are. <laughs> they were basing their documentation that they wrote based on my tweets. It wasn't like they weren't reading it. And they probably had they they wrote documentation on a Sunday night and published it based on my tweets. Uh, so the the way they treated me is not the way that you treat a voter in an election. Well, that I is the problem. Just get used to it because that's the way government is. I I'm not going to get used to it. I have higher expectations. Okay. No, no, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong because I shouldn't realize and I shouldn't do that. That is the wrong way. Then I'm uh, playing into their game. I'm accepting that I'm invisible and I can't do that because I wasn't speaking only on my behalf. I was speaking on behalf of other people. And it, I can't accept that the system is like this. It's not, it, it, it's not in me. It's not wired in me. It shouldn't be like this and it should change. I, so I'm... I'm <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't I can't accept status quo. It has to change. Very good, yeah. And I will I won't become jaded because it this is a set of people in Norway. It's not going to change. Most people don't care. And uh, I've had a enough people cared that we did change it. Ten days before the election, we made a regulation that changed how ballots were counting all over Norway. We did that because you care. We did that because you fight in public. We did that because I said yes to every freaking journalist. It happens because you don't accept status quo. Well, I, I agree with you. and I, I really uh, sympathize with you. But I was the one writing the uh, hearing uh, answer in 2006 on behalf of me saying that the electronic voting system was a really bad idea, it was not democratic, it was not uh, secret, it was not validatable, it had all these problems. And yes, they went ahead with internet voting and the really nice technological solution that was a marvel in uh, encryption and signing and, uh, well, the technology was splendid. Even got some mathematicians uh, <coughs> blank in their eyes and said, yeah, this might work. And sure, it might work if you have a lot of PhD students supervising it all the time, but in practice it's a black box where you just have to trust the, the history about what's going on inside it. Uh, I totally agree. Nothing happened. Because nothing Something happened. happened. The project was cancelled. Something happened. The project was cancelled. Yes. And it did. It didn't happen right then. And that's the problem also, that it's very hard to feel like you accomplish something when you're still being ignored. But you do have an effect, even though nobody will give you credit for it. The effect happens in real life and you kind of have to just take the little crumbles of affirmation that you can to try to keep on trucking because nobody's going to give it to you because nobody's, n he said, he, it's like give the civil activism prize to Patricia, but the, come on, nobody's going to give me a prize. I still, I, you know, I got 300 more followers on Twitter. <laughs> Yay, me! But, more but... <laughs> okay, but it, uh, it's uh, Eddie first. I think the thing that both your story and Petter's does actually show is, again, back to this making you invisible trick is the even if we do do what you forced us to do we're not gonna publicly say okay thanks for bringing that to our attention uh yes we had a broken system and we should have noticed that and you brought it to our attention i don't want to say that because the last thing you want is for the whistleblowers to be encouraged to do more of that <laughs> we don't want to do that again you know it's just 
And and that's why you need other people. You need because they're not going to give you that. And so I need other people on Twitter to go. I think what you did is important. I think what you're doing is important. Because when you get down and you feel like you you get really sad and depressed, then that's the one that goes like, okay, maybe I should continue doing this. And I think that goes for all sorts of activism. We we need we need emotional support too. Okay, he wants to go again. Notice better that you were dis you, you know you had the impression that you had achieved something, but in fact they did end up scrapping what what you had said was a bad idea. So you know the, your impression of having achieved nothing is a sort of it's feel. F Have any more, more time for the questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't want, want to go and grab coffee or something. So just like, <laughs> no. Yes, go. I guess my point didn't come uh, uh, clearly across. Uh, my point is that there are powers at hand you can use to actually affect the system yes. from the outside. Yes. You have laws on your side. You have people on your side. Yes. And you can actually use these mechanisms to affect the system in a positive way. I By think... Real freedom of information but that's... I, I think it was more powerful because I didn't do it. I, but it was done. See? Yeah. That, that's the thing. Two people did. You know and who did? I know both of them now. I didn't know I, the uh, one of them. I only knew uh, before, uh, but two people. Do you also know that one of them has been criticized heavily for misusing the freedom of information system and asking about documents, too many documents, and they are also organizing uh, restructuring the freedom of information system to make sure it will become impossible in the future to do what he is doing. I know. Yeah. But I, I backed him up. I had an interview with NRK, it was, was never published, where I backed him up. I was interviewed inside of Stortinge, uh, where I, I said that what he did was very important. But on the other hand, I also feel like we have to guard these rights as much as we can, both as citizens voting for parties that try to uphold them, but also to not try to abuse them too much so they're taken away. Uh, and this is a balance, uh, but, but I... I it wasn't something I did by myself. This was something that a lot of people did together. And I think that's the important part, that we have to back each other up and we have to help each other. Yeah. And I really hope me and my friend can be a portal for that, to help yes. people help each other. Uh, but my experience is that I've asked people uh, or uh, government officials about privacy issues and can you prove to me that you are actually within the law when you are doing this, and they say, yeah, everything is okay, just move along. Yeah. And then I <coughs> quote the laws and express that they actually have to give me documents describing that we actually have everything in the clear, and they say, well, yeah, well, 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 well. and eventually they decide it's not okay anyway. Uh, because we, are, we have laws, we have good laws in Norway that are actively ignored by a lot of government officials because they can and they will continue to do so unless we actually hold them accountable using these mechanisms that actually work. The thing is, what turned out was that the mechanisms of, of, of public uh, or of getting these documents didn't do anything by itself. They didn't care because nobody was reading them. You need a lot of people. You need people in the media. You need people on social media. You need to, uh, to lift this up so it matters. And, and that means it's not enough to get the documents. You, you 